So, well, thanks all for tuning in on this lovely morning. I um, hope you're all home and healthy and it feels a little odd doing my graduation talk this way, but um, it's, yeah, it's great, great to see all's faces. Uh, as most of you know, my name is Thies. I'm an Interaction Design Master student from the TU Delft, and I've been working as a graduate intern at a design studio called Moro for the last uh, seven months. Uh, since I had never really worked in a professional design environment before, I figured it would be really interesting to turn my uh, graduation project into uh, sort of an internship and have this opportunity to sort of look around and see what it's all about. Um, thanks to Janis, I got in contact with Moro. And just to give you a quick idea of what they do, uh, Moro is a multidisciplinary design studio uh, based in Rotterdam. Uh, they've worked on a wide range of projects, such as um, the new 9292 Journey Planner app, um, but also some spatial design projects and museum installations and much more. Um, so their sort of broad expertise seemed a good fit with my kind of wide range of ideas regarding uh, where this project uh, might be heading. So during my time at Moro, I've been trying to come up with uh, ways to breathe new life into the physical retail stores. Because um, as, as we can all see around us, not even sort of considering the current Corona situation, um, we have a pretty, they have a pretty rough time. Um, according to statistics, about 80% of Dutch consumers do at least part of their shopping online, and this amount is only increasing. Uh, but the physical store is still appreciated for its expertise and experience. The questions are more easily asked in person, and digital shopping is nothing like browsing through an actual rack of clothes. That's not going to change anytime soon, but we can clearly see that the value of this physical uh, retail space is shifting. Uh, it's changing in relation to all of the other available channels and the way people change their consumption habits. Um, this also asks for a reevaluation of what it is retailers should be trying to, uh, trying to accomplish within this store. Hence, we sort of came to, the, to an assignment, which is uh, to create experience proposals that fit the brick and mortar retail environment, um, which engage shoppers in uh, engage shoppers in a suitable and novel way through the synergetic use of the dig digital and physical space. Um, so this leans towards the direction of experiential retail stores that offer experiences rather than products. So aimed at, aimed at creating a connection between brand and consumer instead of you know just selling items. So here's a quick overview of the way I sort of tackled this assignment. Um, this is also the rough structure of the presentation. So if you stick with it, then you kind of know what to expect. Um, I first conducted uh, literature studies uh, regarding the changing retail environment. So this considered both the changing value of the store um, as well as the evolving habits of its shoppers. Those values and habits were combined into three distinct shopper types, each looking for a unique shopping experience. Um, after I developed two exper experiential retail proposals for each type. This was done in a sort of research through design kind of approach by doing weekly design cycles and each resulted in a prototype. I'll also discuss each one later on. Um, but one of those directions was then chosen to be further developed into a final proposal, which is called Live Stories. And this was built into a more elaborate prototype and tested with a more extensive validation study. So back to the assignment. In order to propose fitting proposals, uh, more knowledge was needed regarding the changing value of the store, as well as the evolving habits of today's shoppers. So three main questions need an answer, which is what does the current retail environment look like? Who are those shoppers? And what is the role of the physical retail store? So to answer the first question, a lot has changed over the last, say, 20 years or so. Web shops and the internet in general uh, have had a tremendous impact on the way retail is run. Uh, digitalization has led to the emergence, um, yeah, the emergence of many new channels which uh, have been introduced and integrated into retail strategies. Channels are the communication platforms a brand offers its customers. They can be analog, like a local shop, or digital, uh, like a social media account. This has changed the retail environment from being a single channel to multi-channel. 
single channel retail is a retailer's effort to reach customers through only one distribution option. So this could, for example, be your local bakery. It is only one location, it does not deliver, uh, and it has no online distribution channel. Retailers sometimes still consciously take the decision to do, this way, do it this way. Although seemingly maybe a bit old fashioned, um, it does communicate a sense of integrity and trust towards customers. So there, it turns out there's no need to follow them everywhere they go. They know where to find you. But digitalization has opened up new ways for brands to interact with their customers and vice versa. Through adopting and interweaving new channels and touch points, um, retail has developed from a single towards an omni-channel environment. Whereas the physical store used to be the only place for interaction between brand and customer, our digital lives now offer brands the opportunity to reach their public virtually any place and any time. And also the traditional, uh, transition of uh, traditional values. A good example would be Cool Blue, because besides a web shop, they've opened several physical stores. You can go here to pick up and return your order, or you could even try out new products. And if that's not enough for you, they also have a uh, YouTube channel offering reviews and tech news, have an Instagram account with inspiring projects and a mobile application as well. And if digital is not your thing, well, they also still advertise on billboards. So you can see there's an urge to sort of provide something extra, some kind of service or experience on top of uh, like mere product acquisition. And as a result of the changing retail environment, the convenience value of the brick and mortar store is shifting towards digital channels. Extending this trend into the future indicates a radical change in what shoppers look for in their shopping activity. So back in 1998, Joseph Pine concluded, as goods and services become commoditized, the customer experiences that companies create will matter most. He identified a shift towards customers valuing experiences instead of products. Due to the changing environment and utilitarian value of online channels, those experiences will not revolve around acquiring items, but rather aim at transmitting information, offering content and or sort of allow brand intelligence. Which leads us to the second question. How can retail spaces be used accordingly? With the utilitarian value of buying products decreasing and shifting towards other channels, um, what can these spaces still aim to achieve? What part can I play within the overarching retail strategy? So three main roles were identified. Uh, the first one is the brand as a storyteller. Um, it acts out as a source of inspiration and place for immersion in the brand. Uh, this clip from Harry Potter depicts fairly well how the one store of Mr. Ollivander gives you a sense of his brand or his craftsmanship. It tells a story behind the products he's offering without you even having seen or touched those ones. And with it, it sort of mentally increases the value. You see straight away, this is the probably go-to guy if you want to buy like a new magic stick. The second rule is a sensorial giver. The physical store has the unique ability to deliver a multi-sensorial experience. By tickling sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste, we can create a store environment that leads people uh, that people enjoy and want to dwell in. Think of a toy store allowing kids to try out toys or stretching it to extremes, the chocolate factory of Willy Wonka. It's probably the apex of immersive environments and communicates brand and product values, showing the whole world inside this mystical factory, which really adds to the magic of its candy. The third rule is a human connector. So the store, um, as a human connector by facilitating interactivity and dialogue, not only between brand and customer, but also between customers and peers. The physical environment thrives on such social interactions. This enhances the ability to fulfill a need for community belonging and relationship building, sort of literally linking brand, location, and people. Think, for example, of old record stores or skate shops where customers come together not only to browse or buy products, but also to just sort of, you know, hang out and engage with others. And this is something that is totally lost in a web shop. So after looking at the, the new role of uh, the retail store, we have to define a shopper which we want to target. So we decided to target millennials. 
Uh, millennials or Generation Y are generally considered to be born between, say, the early 80s and mid 90s. They grew up in the first years of the so-called information age, which is the period characterized by a rapid shift from traditional technologies to an economy based on information. These people were born in a world without internet or mobile phones. And over the course of their youth, society has become increasingly connected through digital electronics, drastically changing the ways in which we communicate, collaborate, and consume. So this has led to digital channels becoming a place for character formation, socialization, and politics, secluded from the old. They don't really know how to use it anyway. This new regime of marketeers, however, have made smart use of this and target people with personalized ads aiming to turn public, public personal information into hard cash. However, millennials are starting to become aware of these targeted ads. This has resulted in an increased demand for interactivity, content and information. People don't share ads, people share content. Extending this statement into the on online channel environment and the brick and mortar channel in particular, suggests a radical change in customer experience is necessary in order to remain relevant to the upcoming generation of shoppers. So context is key, content is key, identities are in and ads are out. So all this combined, and with some more research into the shopper uh, motivations and activities, um, has led to the formation of free shopper types or personas. And to give them some character, I combined those types with a specific shoe, which I thought depicted their character. This also helped to gain some direction for the proposals. Um, yeah, helped to gain some direction for the proposals. Uh, stores are nothing without their brands, products, or customers, and hence in order to create relevant experiences, um, customers and products had to be defined. And why sneakers, you might ask? Well, sneakers, because they can be many things to many people. To some, it's like an accessory, and to others, it's a tool, and to another group, it's just a necessary item of clothing. This makes them an interesting product to sort of play with, since shopping motivations and sought-after properties differ greatly between different shoppers. So the first shopper is the Vanskate High shopper. This shopper goes shopping out of necessity. He's a basic shopper, doesn't gain much satisfaction from shopping, and has a clear understanding of what he wants. He goes in, buys the product, and walks straight out. He wears his shoes also down, down to the core. So until the lace is ever ripped, fabric is showing holes, um, sole is punctured. But regardless, they sort of fit like a glove, and the shoes still feel like home, even though they're worn out. Which is also one of the reasons why he'll go for the same pair, and has been postponing you know, replacing his old pair for so long. Um, as we can see, this person has already decided what shoes he wants and is sort of in the middle of wanting to be part of something and wanting to be an individual. The second shopper is the Dr. Martin shopper, which is defined as a social, uh, social shopper with peer group attraction and communicating with others as sort of our main goals. Shopping is a way to spend time with friends. She likes to go shopping, but not too often. Um, tries to go for the sustainable option if budget allows and is skeptical towards traditional marketing. Um, she's been tricked sort of one too many times by companies saying one thing but then acting the opposite. Um, as we can see here, she wants to, she leans more towards uh, wanting to be inspired uh, and wanting to be part of something which is also expressed in uh, the shopping activity. The third shopper we're trying to address is the Adidas Yeezy shopper. Uh, the user shopper is a destination shopper. Um, he goes there for a desired object. The product has become a designer object or an accessory, sort of worn, used, and cared for like jewelry. It's a dedicated buyer. Once announced, his mind is set on a specific pair and he starts finding ways of acquiring it through sneaker drops and such. You could say the shopper is sort of like a modern sneakerhead. So to sum up this research part, through adopting and interweaving new channels and touch points, retail has developed from a single towards an online channel environment. A physical store used to be the place for interaction, but our digital lives have opened up different channels to interact for, uh, between brand and customers. The physical store can act as a brand storyteller, sensorial giver, or human connector. And we have defined three shopper, ty shopper types, the Vans, Dr. Martens, and Adios Yeezy Shopper, which all are 
all are looking for like a unique experience within the retail environment. Which leads us to the retail proposals. Um, the proposals and their experiential setups served as uh, research prototypes. So they have a connection to theory, which I researched prior to uh, developing these prototypes. Um, and as such are vehicles of sort of like knowledge production. As such, they, they process and communicate knowledge. And unlike uh, design and industrial prototypes, they don't really aim at improving appearance or functionality, but more um, at gaining like an understanding of why this theory that we just uh, conducted works. So to build these prototypes, for a good couple of weeks, I kerned off a fair bit of Morrow Studio and made it look like this. Um, forever grateful for them allowing me to do this, but it made me for quite a, a mysterious vibe for six long weeks. And even if they took a peek behind the curtains, it often looked like a potential murder case waiting to happen. But I'm glad to announce no one died in the process. So to start with the first shopper type, the Vanskate High Shopper, um, often the old pair of shoes is stored at home next to the numerous others, uh, since they might come in handy in sometime in the future, but mostly because they have some sort of sentimental value. Um, think of it as sort of like a trinket from your youth, like baby clothes. Um, it's not something we often think about when replacing our worn down kicks, but I mean, the value is kind of interesting. However, the presence of these memories uh, serves as a determinant for product attachment and brand loyalty. So the more memories, the more attached you get to this product. Those memories are there within your head. You just don't really associate them with the shoes. Facilitating uh, your consumers to sort of reminisce about the relationship with a product at its end of life could therefore increase the product's value plus the chance of it being rebought and or recommended in the future. Um, hence, I defined a goal for the proposals in regard to the shopper, which is to assist shoppers to reminisce about past adventures by means of their old sneakers, ultimately enhancing product attachment and brand loyalty values. So I developed two proposals. The first one is called samsara, um, which is uh, memories in Hindu. This, um, so the, the thing I want to communicate here is something like a, like a phoenix dying and rising from its ashes. So when the, um, at the end of life of the shoes, uh, they sort of like get reborn into the new pair. Um, because this, this replacement of his shoes has been postponed due to the seemingly sort of like irreplaceable comfort. Um, but what exactly makes this comfort? It's probably this attachment for familiarity. So the goal was to turn this replacement of the shoes into a sort of end of life remembrance ceremony, ultimately sort of celebrating the cycle of life and death. So I created a space which looked like this when you walked in. Um, it's almost like a mortuary in, in a sense. Um, but after you walk in, the experience is sort of divided into two stages. So first you walk in, you see this, uh, you know, altar standing here and you take off your shoes and put them on a pedestal. Uh, nothing compares to you is playing in the background, which is sort of a sad song about remembering a lost friend and a spot turns on and colored light LEDs light up underneath the shoes, which you'll see in a minute. So the lights turn on and boom, there goes the spotlight, which sort of makes your shoes feel like a museum object. The shoppers offered a last moment of reflection, sort of like a silent eulogy. After 30 seconds though, the shoes get in, are standing there and they get engulfed in smoke. Um, after which I took them away and replaced them with a new pair. Um, this to sort of like symbolize uh, the someone else joining, symbolize the uh, reviving of these shoes and how the the old shoes sort of um, you know transfer into this new pair. So the insights I took from this are the object itself does not cue memories, and the music and/or sound helps the shopper to immerse himself into this experience. Um, the experience proved successful in terms of like emotional resonance. Subjects indicated that the moody use of light and sound um, evoked sort of a 
retrospective state or evoked reminiscence. However, this emotional state did not really prove sufficient. Um, this is mostly due to the fact that linking shoes and memories is not something we naturally do. The shoes are always there, but they never take on a primary role. So this is key for memory re uh, recollection. So more explorative iteration needed to be done, which aimed at uh, trying to aid the shopper in recalling those memories. Which leads me to the second proposal, which is called Scar Stories. So on a pair of sneakers, you could define two different types of wear and tear. Slow, like the wearing down of a sole over time from normal use, and fast, like a tear in the fabric from a specific moment. Like scars on your body, this fast wear serves as a memory cue for specific events experienced while wearing these shoes. Events that quite literally left their mark. Um, remembering events experienced during use through wear and tear marking the shoes could be a way of, again, you know, enhancing this product attachment. So the setup looked like this. When entering the setup, the subject sees one used shoe hanging from the ceiling. Um, behind the shoe against the back wall, a TV scan line is continuously being projected. On a closer look, the subject can notice there are several marks on the shoe, each indicating memory touch points. So we can see this over here where the shopper walks in, I'll skip a little bit. So we walk up to the shoe and after he gaps it, you can see that there are several touch points indicated with little stickers that are hard to see in a video, but they were there. Um, and when touching these, these points, certain memories started playing in the background. Um, so ultimately these memories would be attached to the exact scar. So this, the scars you're touching um, would be translated directly into a memory that you know, um, made that scar. So what did I gain out of this? Um, the insights link between memory and scar was often unclear. Um, this could be attributed to the fact that neither the shoes nor the memories used in the setup were the subject's own. So they don't provoke the intended emotional response. And the history of the, the shoe was found to be adding to the product's value, which was a positive, because this could be extended to other product categories as well, or stores such as thrift shops. This isn't you know, unique to the shoe. Also, um, you could consider like making a museum of the same model of shoes. Um, so these were the, the two proposals for the van shopper. So I continue with the Dr. Martin shopper. Because uh, despite the fact that Dr. Martin shared a uh, brand meaning, despite the fact that dogs share, uh, share brand meaning is shaped by its wearers, um, there's not much brand consumer interaction when it comes to sort of exchanging ideology, ideologies and values. Um, currently feels like a sort of one-way conversation. Users feel part of the brand and its user group mostly through consumption, but are not actively engaged in shaping what it stands for. Facilitating conversation regarding social cultural values and political viewpoints um, could continuously sort of shape and strengthen the shared brand meaning, hence increasing also the brand loyalty for activation. And what better place to have this conversation than in a physical store? So the goal we have with these proposals is to have the shopper's personal values and ideals continuously shape the public brand image of Dr. Martens, hence creating a sense of community around the brand. And the first proposal I made was what we stand for. Um, my aim was to make customers feel supported in their personal values by sharing what they stand for in a sort of collective brand statement. By utilizing and presenting customer values as the foundation of the brand zone, the message, we buy, uh, message expressed by wearing a pair of ducks sort of becomes more sincere and um, the consumer's own. So to initiate this conversation, an in-store overview of customers and their personal values was created. Um, a wall depicts shoppers wearing their ducks and the viewer can scroll through these figures and examine the diversity of people attached to the brand. So every figure also has a personal value attached, which can either be viewed or listened to when selected. This way shoppers can explore others' contemporary identities, which together sort of shape the core values of Dr. Martens. So 
a couple of insights we gained from this was the grouping of values could help to create an overview of different topics. Um, <clears throat> so there's no uh, and there's no call to action. So there's a there's a need for empowerment as such. Um, besides that, the proposal did not really have the intended effect because it was the uh, the I intended to do something else with it and had to you know turn to a paper prototype, um, which was. I try to fix in the second proposal, which is called Action Center. Um, with Action Center is an open branded activist center or community uh, facilitating patrons to initiate and organize endeavors, such as sort of workshops and lectures. Um, because extending the current trend of shifting sales from offline to online channels into the future. Um, yeah, so could say that the shop isn't really about selling products anymore. And we can use this physical space to actually, you know, get people together. And in order to get people there, um, you need to actually get people from their own house to this, you know, physical retail space, even if they are ordering products online and getting them delivered to their home. Um, so there's no direct need for customers to visit sort of the brand's physical location. So there's a need to persuade buyers to come by and get acquainted with Dr. Martin's community center. Um, in order to do so, besides promoting events through media channels, a personalized call to arms is hidden in the shoebox, which is received upon ordering. So in line with the brand's public statements, uh, the letter states the current condition of our world and sort of asks the shopper to you know, play its part and uh, join in in the sort of revolution that they're trying to get at. Space consists, consists of uh, three segments. One side portrays current active members, uh, another displays video content regarding current issues, and a third is a pin board with posters informing visitors about like running campaigns and, and such, which they can join. So a quick video of how this looks like. We had a video running in the back, and then the posters on the right and the active members on the left. This is gonna take a little bit too long. I'm just going to click through it. So here we have our active members and participants were asked to sort of, you know, hang up their own, um, their own photo as well. Just, you know, become part of this volunteer group. So the overall insights were that the, uh, the personalized call to action was surprising and sparked a sense of curiosity. Um, the combined elements within the space effectively conveyed a sense of community and branding in a volunteering goodwill environment turned out to be sort of tricky. It needs to be made clear that the brand does not have a, have a direct interest, but rather wants to sort of play its part, um, which I think uh, the, the current state of uh, Rumach is a pretty good example of that. And the third shopper we're trying to address is the Adidas Yeezy shopper. So the Adidas Yeezy is designed by um, uh, artist Kanye West um, through a sort of co-branding strategy between this artist and the brand Adidas. So co-branding through celebrity endorsement creates associations in the minds of consumers. Kanye West's active involvement in the development of Yeezy helps to make it stand out amongst other lines in the marketplace. So for the brand to continue to thrive, it is important that the brand continues to reflect the sort of branding that West builds for himself. So the goal we're trying to achieve is enhancing the emotional resonance between shopper and product by communicating product brand aspects through intimacy, sensuality, and mystery. The first proposal tries to do that is prime knit patterns. Um, by magnifying the material features of the sneakers, uh, such that the shopper experience, uh, experiences them as if sort of like shrunken down, um, and sort of tell the story of the material through a sensorial experience. So I want to give this feeling sort of like stepping through the looking glass and stepping into this different world. So to give you a little background, this is the Yeezy Boost 350. It's uh, the fifth shoe in the Adidas Yeezy line. And one of the things that makes it unique is this uh, prime knit pattern, which they call is uh, the weaving pattern they use in the outside fabric, um, which sort of gives it a sock light fit, which you know shapes to your feet. Um, it's an aspect that's pretty unique to this shoe, and this is the only casual wear shoe that you know is using this uh, technology. But it's sort of lost in the um, um, in the communication online. So to make the customer aware of this unique unique aspect of the shoes, they have to sort of interact with this enlarged life size version of the knitting pattern. The shoes are suspended behind a maze of strings, which the shopper will have to like 
the strings are sort of like guarding these shoes like lasers at a bank. And in order to obtain these shoes, customers have to pull apart and step through these patterns. This way, they experience the different materials, material properties and what they add to the shoe, which are strength, comfort, and aesthetic. So the link between product and setup was sort of lost. Um, this is also due to the fact that the, the actual shoes weren't present. Um, and as hence, you know, people didn't really, weren't really aware of uh, the properties of this shoe. Uh, also, the patterns successfully communicate, but the patterns did successfully communicate material properties. Uh, participants said it was kind of interesting, you know, playing around with the, the patterns I created and how they, uh, you know, communicated strength and uh, flexibility. So the second proposal is Sunday service. Um, the current line of line of Yeezys are designed from the perspective of Kanye West's ideal new sort of thriving society and faith and the reaffirmation of the authority of both God and Jesus sort of play a central role within this imagined post-liberal world. Um, as I want you to sort of step into this world of Yeezy and have the, the shoe transfer, uh, transfer into you, your world. Um, so this is a uh, impression of one of Kanye West's Sunday service, uh, Sunday service um, choirs. And I sort of translated this into into an environment which is lit from all sides to sort of give you this immersive feeling. Um, and uh, yeah, as you can see here, there's grass on the floor to actually have you sort of step into a different environment and create this, you know, different sensation from the world around it. And if you look up, you can see the, um, the shoes being suspended from the top. And to sort of play into the sense of anticipation that goes sort of hand in hand with sneaker drops, the shoes are presented to the customer as if they are handed down by God. So you sort of have to put your hand in the spotlight and then the, the shoes come descending. So this gave sort of a full, just gave me a couple of insights, full immersion as for a more isolated space. Um, this proposal was built within the uh, design or within the studio and wasn't really isolated from outside sounds and such. And as such, the, this was kind of, you know, um, lost or this feeling was kind of lost. Also the moment of the anticipation enhanced the perceived desire. So looking up and seeing the shoes and seeing them come down and presented to you, um, actually was a good stimuli. Which leads us to the final proposal. So like I said before, I didn't really have enough time in my project to um, develop uh, another you know, make another step in every direction. So together with Moro, we decided to continue with the defense gate high shopper. So uh, the concepts about like reminiscing and thinking about memories that are attached to products. Um, and I want to start out with a quote from a book by Italo Covino, which I think really fits this, fits this concept. Um, the quote goes as follows. As this wave from memory flows in, the city soaks it up like a sponge and expands. A description of Zyra as it is today should contain all Zyra's past. The city, however, does not tell its past, but contains it like the lines of a hand, written in the corners of the streets, the gratings of the windows, the banisters of the steps, the antennae of the lightning rods, poles of the flags, every segment marked in turn with scratches, indentations, and scrolls. Um, you could sort of, you know, replace the city uh, with any product or thing that embeds a, a memory or a history. Which is also, you know, again, part of the, the product attachment theory by, um, uh, proposed by Red Muffin. Um, a product becomes irreplaceable if it has a sense of self-expression, group affiliation, pleasure and memories. The first two are already present in this shelter, but the, sec the, the last two, and especially memories, we can aim at sort of enhancing and, and strengthening that aspect. Which led me to live stories. So the goal of this setup is to evoke episodic recall of past events through a multi-sensory experience, which aims to create a reminiscent, stimulating environment. Um, the subject is led through the installation by a spoken story, written from the perspective of his or her pair of shoes. Um, as you can see here in the videos, there are sort of five steps to this, uh, to this installation. The first is an introduction area, the second area, um, sort of lets the, the shelper explore soundscapes. The third area lets the shelper explore uh, videos that are embedded in the shoes. Um, the fourth uh, op offers an opportunity to sort of say goodbye. And the fifth um, sort of revives the shoes. 
and um, it sort of looks the the setup sort of looked like this. So every area was um, divided from or you know parted from the other by curtains and and walls. And if you follow the swoosh, you sort of follow the the participants' path uh, through the installation. So as you can, might be hard to see in the photo, but there's uh, three columns: two on the left, and one on the right, um, and uh, the stool that can also be seen on uh, this little overview over here can also be seen on the top right corner. Um, so area one in this picture is area is the top right area over here, and the last area, area five, is top left. Um, so to go through these steps one by one, the first one is the introduction. So the, the shopper is um, welcomed with uh, by a voice coming from down under the stool. It says like, hey pal, down here. Didn't, didn't know we talked, did you? We're sort of surprised as well, to be honest. So it serves as an introductory area. Um, the shopper enters not knowing where he is or where to go next and what to expect. So there needs to be this sort of like welcoming. Um, after the shopper is asked to you know, uh, remove his shoes and take them into the next stage. In the next stage, soundscapes are, uh, are presented. So the shoppers are unaware of the implicit memories that are embedded in these shoes. Hence, like an introduction of the concept of those memories seems sort of necessary. Um, by placing the shoes on the pillar, as you can see right now, they sort of light up and signify their value. Um, reaching back out to the shoes, soundscapes can be heard resembling personal memories. Um, gesturing around the shoes sort of opens up three different uh, different soundscapes. One depicting a concert, one depicting community or uh, commuting sounds, and one uh, having uh, like beach sounds to it. Which sort of you know makes the shopper um, aware of the fact that there's something hidden inside. In the next area, like more elaborate memories are presented. So now the shopper is aware of the presence of memories in the shoes. Um, the shopper is invited to explore its content and you know, sort of see what more is present. So walking in, he is presented with a life-size projection of the scan line. Um, getting closer while holding out the shoes, uh, glimpses of memories start fading in and out. And, and shortly, a pattern is recognized and sort of a range of memories can be explored by using the shoes as an antenna. Um, again, after the shopper is um, uh, told to, you know, enter the next stage, which is the parting stage. It's kind of dark, it was hard to photograph, but um, after reminiscing, it's, you know, after reminiscing in the previous stage, it's time to say goodbye. Um, the old, sh old shoes thank the shopper for the good times, and it's sort of a funeral ceremony. He puts them inside the pillar. Uh, but uh, he then pushes a button and a, and a blender starts set. And you can sort of hear the sound of a blender. Um, if we click through, we can see that down here, after the blender has sounded, you can pick up a bowl, which has bits of like shredded shoe inside, um, which sort of signify the sole of the shoe. Uh, so he's then told to, you know, enter the next stage again, which is the revive stage. So the shopper is now carrying a bowl with remnants of his old shoes and a mystical pillar emitting smoke from the top is standing in the middle of the space. He pours the old pieces into the smoke, after which it you know, sort of starts rumbling. A light starts shining from inside and the new shoes appear slowly ascending from inside to the top. And after greeting, he realizes it's the same voice. Um, so the shoes are sort of revived. The relationship continues, not materially, but mentally. So up until the final proposal, all experiences uh, have been validated in like a studio setting through interviews with colleagues. And although this method uh, was sufficient for the purpose of those proposals, it does not really tell whether the underlying ideas worked in the real, real world. Hence, in order to sort of validate assumptions regarding the effects of the proposed retail setup, as well as its value to regular consumers, a test night was organized. The session aimed to address four questions. So to what extent does the experience evoke an emotional connection uh, between part participant and shoes? To what extent does the experience enhance the perceived value of the shoes? And what is the overall opinion about changing the physical retail store into such an experiential retail concept? So this was the test night I organized uh, prior to the uh, whole uh, quarantine situation, kind of unimaginable at the moment. 
Um, and these were my participants. There were a total of 18 participants for this test. Um, nine were students and the other nine were sort of working professionals. Some of, were, some of them were friends of mine, others were people working at the studio, and others were friends of people working at the studio. Um, there was a mix in terms of fashion affiliation, um, as well as you know, um, affiliation with shoes and such. Um, all indicated also a mix of on and offline shopping was preferred. Um, but they also indicated most buying of new products was usually done online, since this seems to ensure getting the best price. So I'm going to skip through this and show you later. Um, but to answer the first question, to what extent does the experience evoke an emotional connection between participant and shoe? Um, well, even though the media used throughout the experience wasn't the participant's own, the majority mentioned they still resonated on a personal, on a personal level. This was mostly due to the way they were presented. So having the shoes sort of tell their life story through memories in which the participant is incorporated as a close friend. The buildup of this relationship seemed successful even in such a short amount of time. Um, it was also noted that uh, some, um, some clothing items uh, might even have a more particular value embedded um, that can be reminisced upon. For example, um, one of the participants indicated he wore a specific pair of shoes to the funeral of a good friend. Uh, this is, however, we got to see how to sort of play into this as a brand. Second question, to what extent does the experience enhance the perceived value of the shoes? Um, participants' uh, comments indicated the experience made them sort of rethink the purpose of their own footwear. The narrative did add like an emotional dimension to the appreciation of the product. And on top of its obvious like utilitarian value, um, it was surprising to see that you know this um, this was actually changing even for people that didn't you know really affiliate with the shoe. It, um, the test was done with an unfamiliar pair of shoes and you know a second a set of secondhand mementos. The third question: What is the overall opinion about changing the physical retail store into such an uh, an experiential retail concept? Um, comments were made about how such an experience could like make shopping a more conscious, positive activity. Uh, participants said it made them more aware of the fact that they are buying a new product and appreciate it as such. Whereas current stores sometimes try to conceal this. In turn, this sort of sense of appreciation could enhance shoppers' sustainable consumption. Um, they also mentioned it made them more aware of the products you already have, uh, which is sort of like an added, ben added benefit of this. So, um, to conclude, um, Retail has developed from a single towards an omni-channel environment. Rather than working in uh, parallel communication channels and their supporting resources are designed and sort of orchestrated to cooperate. Um, there are sort of three distinct roles that the physical store can take, which is a brand storyteller, sensorial giver, and human connector. And we have defined three different shopper types, the fence shopper, Dr. Martin shopper, and Adidas Yeezy shopper. Um, the concepts we propose for each of these uh, are based on product attachment in case of the fan shopper, um, sort of like a community center in case of the Dr. Martin shopper, and more of a brand or product experience in the case of the Adidas Yeezy shopper. And the final concept, live stories, aim to enrich this narrative through the use of interactive elements, which allow the shopper to explore memories embedded in the product. Um, these memories are snippets from the, the shopper's digital media collection, photos and videos taken throughout the product's life cycle. Um, presenting this media as if they are intimate moments remembered by the shoes turns those memories into shared experiences, ultimately enhancing their embedded meaning. Um, provided, providing such an experience in a physical store not only allows for total immersion, but also adds a sense of authenticity and integrity, which is hard to replicate in digital channels. Um, so, I mean, we're already a little bit over time, but that's it. Um, 